this section begins Unit uh, 4 in our course, and we're going to start in Probability, Empirical and Theoretical Probabilities. So some definitions. An experiment is a controlled operation that yields a set of results, and the possible or results of the experiment are called the outcomes. An event is a sub-collection of the outcomes of an experiment. Empirical probability is the relative frequency of occurrence of an event and is determined by actually observing the experiment. Theoretical probability is determined through a study of the possible outcomes that can occur. We don't have to actually do the experiment. Empirical probability or relative frequency, the probability of an event can be determined using this formula. In the numerator, we have the number of times that the event has occurred and it's divided by the total number of times the experiment has been performed. So for example, if we tossed a coin 100 times and we got 44 heads, determine the empirical probability of a coin landing heads up. So that would be 44 out of 100 or 0.44. At the Virgin Music Store in Times Square, 60 people entering the store were selected at random and asked to choose their favorite type of music. Of the 60, 12 picked rock, 16 country, 8 classical, and 24 chose something else. Determine the uh, empirical probability the next person entering the store favors rock music. So rock music would be 12 out of 60, or 1 out of 5. Country would be 16 out of 60, 4 out of 15. In an election for student council president at Sage College, 80 students were polled and asked who they would vote for. The results are shown here. If one student from Sage is selected at random, determine the following probability. The probability the student planned to vote for Allison. So that's going to be 22 out of 80, or 11 out of 40, or 0.275. The probability that the student planned to vote for Kimberly, and that's going to be 20 out of 80, or 1 quarter, or 0.25. The law of large numbers states that probability statements apply in practice to a large number of trials, not to a single trial. It's the relative frequency over the long run that is accurately predictable, not an individual result. So if we notice here, if we toss a coin only 10 times, we maybe only saw four heads. But if we continue to toss the coin, the more times we toss it, the expected number of heads that we get gets closer and closer to the theoretical probability of 0.5. If an outcome of an experiment has the same chance of occurring as any other outcome, then the outcomes are said to be equally likely. The theoretical probability of an event can be calculated using the following probability formula. The number of outcomes favorable to event E in the numerator divided by the possible number of outcomes. If we roll the fair die, determine the probability of rolling five different outcomes here. So what's the probability of getting a two? So we know there's only one two, so it's going to be one out of six. The probability of rolling an even number, and that can occur three ways. We could get a two, a four, or a six. So that would be three over six, or one half. The probability that the three numbers are, the probability of getting a number greater than three, and that would be getting a four, five, or a six. So that would be three out of six, or one half. The probability of getting a 7, there's no outcomes that result in a 7, so that would probability would be 0, and this is what we call an impossible event. And the probability of getting a number less than 7, and we know all the outcomes are less than 7, so this has to be 6 out of 6 or 1, and this is called a sure or a certain event. The probability of any event that cannot occur is 0, we mentioned this before, this is an impossible event. The probability of an event that must occur is 1, and this is called sure or certain event. Every probability is a number between 0 and 1 inclusive. The sum of the probabilities of all the outcomes in the sample space has to add up to 1. And also, the probability of A plus the probability of not A happening has to equal 1. Or we can rewrite it this way. The probability of not A equals 1 minus the probability of A. And this is called the complement rule. The event not A is called the complement of the event A. If the probability of A is 0.72, what's the probability of event A does not occur? We can use that formula we just showed. So the probability of not A is going to be 1 minus 0.72 or 0.28. And let's select one card from a deck. Here's the standard deck of 52 cards. And just quickly, there's 52 cards in a poker deck, four suits. Hearts and diamonds are red. Clubs and spades are black. Kings, queens, and jacks are called picture or face cards. And again, here's a summary of what you see there. So let's determine the probability if we pick one card that we get different outcomes here. So what's the probability that we get an 8? There are four 8s in the deck of cards, so that's going to be 4 out of 52, or 1 out of 13. The probability that we don't get an 8, 
1 minus the probability that we do get an 8, or 12 out of 13. The probability that we get a club. There are 13 clubs in the deck, so the probability we get a club is 13 out of 52, or 1 quarter. The probability that we get a jack, a queen, or a king, that means what's the probability that we get a picture or face card? There's a total of 12 face cards in the deck, so the probability of getting a face card or picture card is 12 out of 52, or 3 over 13. The probability that we get a heart and a spade. Now, a heart and a spade can't happen together. Those are disjoint or mutually exclusive events, so the probability of this event is 0. The probability that we get a card greater than 5 and less than 9. So the cards that are greater than 5 and less than 9 are the 6 of the 7s and the 8s, and there are 4 of each of those, or 12 cards. So the probability of that is 12 over 52, or 3 out of 13. Uh, section 11.3 deals with what we call expected value, or expectation. And this is what's used to determine the expected result of an experiment or a business adventure over the long term. And here's how we calculate it. We take the probability of each outcome times the amount that outcome is worth, and we add those all up. And the symbol P1 represents the probability the first event will occur, A1 the amount that would be won or lost, and so forth. So let's try an example. JetBlue Airlines is considering adding a route from Boston to Minneapolis. Before making a decision, the company needs to consider many factors, including potential profit or loss. After considerable research, JetBlue estimates there, if it adds the route, there is a 60% chance of making an annual $800,000 profit. So there's one of my probabilities, and there's one of my amounts. A 10% chance of breaking even, so no gain or loss, zero profit. And a 30% chance of losing $1 million. How much can JetBlue expect to make annually on this new route? So we're going to set this up as an expectation. So we've got 0.6 times the 800,000 plus 0 0.1 times 0 minus, we have a loss here on the 1 million, and when we simplify that, we come up with an expectation of $180,000. So in the long run, JetBlue or JetBlue Airlines would have an expectation of a gain of $180,000 to add this particular route. However, you must remember there's a 30% chance they would lose $1 million. Let's work on a door prize problem. When Josh attends a charity event, he's given a free ticket for a $50 door prize. A total of 100 tickets are given out. Determine his expectation of winning the door prize. Okay, so there's two outcomes. He can win 1 out of 100, and he gets $50. He cannot win, which is 99 out of 100, and he doesn't lose anything because the ticket was free. So his expectation is going to be 50 cents. So in the long run, if Josh played this game over and over again, he would expect to win on average 50 cents. The fair ticket price, or the fair price, is the amount to be paid that results in an expected value of zero. It is found by adding the cost to play to the expected value. At a game of chance, the expected value is found to be negative $1.50, and the cost to play is $4. Determine the fair price to play the game. So remember what we do. We add the expected value to the cost to play. Don't forget to put the negative sign in. And so $2.50 would be the fair price to play this game. If the cost to play was $2.50, the expectation would be zero. Suppose you're playing a game in which you spin the pointer shown in the figure and you are awarded the amount shown under the pointer. If it costs $10 to play the game, determine the expectation of the person who plays the game and also the fair ticket price or the fair price to play the game. So I set up a little table here. There are four different amounts to be won, $2, $10, $15, and $20. And the probabilities are given here. So for $2, there's actually uh, three out of eight spots on the circle. Uh, for $10, the same thing, 15, one out of eight, and 20, one out of eight. Now remember, it costs $10 to play. So if I win $2 and I pay $10 to play, I've actually ended up losing uh, overall $8. If I win $10 and it costs me $10 to play, I come up with a zero. Um, if I win $15, I pay $10 to play, so my net amount is five and so forth. And then I can figure out my expectation using my formula. And so my expectation here comes out to be negative $1.13. And the second part of the question was, what's the fair price? So we take the expectation plus the cost to play, and we come up with a fair price of $8.87. And the last section we're covering, uh, no, one more section, I'm sorry, two more sections. Tree diagrams. 
Tree diagrams are a great way to show the sample space for an experiment. If the first experiment can be performed in m distinct ways, and a second experiment can be performed in n distinct ways, the two experiments in that specific order can be performed in m times n ways. The sample space is a list of all the possible outcomes of an experiment, and a sample point is each individual outcome in the sample space. And tree diagrams are helpful to determining the sample space and the individual sample points. So for example, a box contains four marbles, one red, one blue, one brown, and one uh, green. If we select two, determine the number of sample points if we replace the first marble before selecting the second marble. Okay, so there's four ways to pick the first one and four ways to pick the second one. So there's 16 different outcomes in the sample space. If we don't replace after the first draw, we have four selections for the first marble, but we only have three for the second. So now we've got 12 sample points. Josh is buying a new computer system. He can select from four different monitors, three different keyboards, and five different printers. Assuming his system will include a monitor, a keyboard, and a printer, how many systems can he select from? So we're going to use the counting principle and simply multiply here, and there's 60 different systems that he could uh, build. Two balls are be to be selected with replacement from a bag that contains one red, one blue, one orange, and one green. Use the counting principle to determine the number of points in the sample space. So there's 4 times 4 because we're replacing here 16, and we want to show a tree diagram to list the sample space. So the first ball could be red, blue, green, or orange, and the second ball can also be the same colors. So here's the tree diagram. So here's my first selection, and here's my second selection. And if you notice the tree diagram, you actually draw a line and then come up with all the sample points in the sample space. Determine the probability that neither ball selected is orange. So if I go back, neither ball is orange. I look at all the sample points here and I see where do I have outcomes where I don't have any orange balls. One, two, uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, looks like nine. These all have orange in them. And so if I count up there, so I know the probability that neither ball is an orange is nine out of 16. Determine the probability that the orange ball is selected at least once. Again, if you go back and look at the figure, there are seven points that have the orange ball at least one time. So the probability of at least one orange ball is 7 out of 16. And if you notice, on this kind of a problem, having the tree diagram actually is very helpful because you can simply count the points in the sample space to answer the probability question. And then the last section for probability this week is the AND and the OR problems in probability. The OR problem requires to get a successful outcome for at least one of the given events. So the probability of A or B, we're going to use this formula. The probability of event A or B is the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability that they both occur. So if the probability of A and B is 0.3 and the probability of A is 0.7, probability of B is 0.5, find the probability of A or B. So we're going to use our formula. And we know these parts on the right-hand side, so we can solve for probability of A or B. And if we simplify the right-hand side, we come up with 0.9. Mutually exclusive events, it means that it's impossible for the events to occur simultaneously. If two events are mutually exclusive, then the probability of A and B is zero. Another word for mutually exclusive is disjoint. And when we have mutually exclusive events, the addition formula simply simplifies to the probability of A or B equals probability of A plus the probability of B. We don't have to subtract off the probability of A and B because it's zero. One card is selected from a standard deck of playing cards. Determine whether the following pairs of events are mutually exclusive and then determine the probability of A or B. Okay, so we want to have event A, B, we draw an ace, and event B, we draw a nine. Okay, it's impossible to select both at the same time, so they're mutually exclusive, and we can simply add their probabilities. So the probability of getting an ace is 4 out of 52. The probability of getting a 9 is also 4 out of 52. That comes up to 8 out of 52, or 2 out of 13. The probability of getting an ace and getting a heart. These are not mutually exclusive, so we have to use this formula. So the probability of an ace, again, 4 out of 52. 13 um, heart cards, 13 out of 52, and then there's one heart ace, so we have to subtract 1 out of 52, and we come up with 16 out of 52, or 4 out of 13. The probability of selecting a red card or a black card. 
These are mutually exclusive, so we can simply add their probabilities, and this actually comes out to be one, because when we pick a card from a deck, we have to get a red card or a black card. The probability of getting a picture card or a red card. These are not mutually exclusive. So the probability of a picture card, if you remember from before, is 12 out of 52. Red card, 26 out of 52. And then there are six uh, red picture cards, so we subtract 6 out of 52, and we come up with 32 out of 52, or 8 out of 13. And probability problems require a favorable event in each of the given events. And we're going to use this formula. If you want to think about this, when there's an and problem, you're using a multiplication formula. When it's an or problem, you're using an addition formula. When using the multiplication formula, we always assume that the event A has occurred when calculating probability of B because we're determining the probability of getting a favorable outcome in both of the events. So two cards are to be drawn without replacement from a deck of cards. Determine the probability that we get two spades. The first time we pick from the deck, there are 13 spades out of 52. We don't put the card back, so when we go back in, there are 51 cards left, and we're going to assume that we got a spade the first time, and we're going to say there are 12 out of 51 on the second pick. So the probability of getting two spades if we don't replace the first card is going to be, we multiply it out and simplify, 1 out of 17. Events A and B are independent if the occurrence of either event in no way affects the probability of the other event. Rolling dice and tossing coins are examples of independent events. 100 people attended a charity benefit to raise money for cancer research. Three people in attendance uh, will be selected to win uh, without replacement, and each one will be given a door prize. Are the events of selecting the three people who will be awarded the door prize independent or dependent events? They're dependent because every time we pick a person, it changes the probability of the next person being selected. Uh, because once we select a person, they're not going to be replaced. It's sampling without replacement. In general, any experiment in which two or more items are selected without replacement, the events will be dependent. And then the probability of an event occurring at least once is equal to 1 minus the probability that the event does not happen. This is our complement rule. If we draw three cards from a deck of 52, what's the probability that we get at least one ace? So that would mean we would get one ace or two aces or three aces. And it's much easier to calculate it using this formula. The probability of getting at least one ace is one minus the probability that we don't get any aces. And no ace on the first draw, 48 cards are not aces out of 52. Second draw, we don't put the first card back, 47 out of 51, 46 out of 50. If we go ahead and simplify that, it's 0.217. So the probability of getting at least one ace if we draw three cards is a little bit more than 21%. Mr. and Mrs. Miller just moved into a new home and they need to buy kitchen appliances. The chart below shows the brands of appliances they are considering. Determine the probability that they select GE for all three, then no GE, and then at least one GE. So GE for all, that would be GE for refrigerator, and for stove, and for dishwasher. And that's going to be one-third times one-third times one-third, or one out of 27. The probability of no GE that's going to be two-thirds times two-thirds times two-thirds. And then the probability of at least one GE appliance is going to be one minus the probability that they didn't pick any GE appliances, which you just calculated in Part B. And that's going to be 19 out of 27. So this is our introduction to probability. And again, we'll finish up this unit next week, uh, but this is the first half of uh, uh, Unit 4.